well, welcome everybody and thank you for being here. Um, my job has almost been done by Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. He's done lots of the introductions. But just on behalf of the Department of Politics and International Relations, on behalf of the Civil Foster Committee, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Frederica Mogherini, our 2019 Civil Foster Speaker. Thank you so much for taking time out of... We know you're incredibly busy scheduled to talk to us. It's a real pleasure. Some of us already have had a snapshot. We had a very nice lunch Chatham House Rules discussion. We've had a few tidbits of what's to come. So thank you very much for spending time with us already. I'm sure um, Frederick will be known to many of you. Um, as Andrea has just told you, she's the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Vice President of the European Commission uh, since the 1st of September 2014. Uh, she's also been the Italian Minister for Foreign Affairs um, in 2014 and a member of the Italian Parliament elected for the first time in 2008. And in that capacity, she held a number of roles, including the head of the Italian delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, um, vice president of its political committee, member of the Italian delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Secretary of the Defence Committee and Member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So to that huge portfolio, her current roles include also a German Marshall Fund for the United States, Member of the European Leadership Network for Multilateral Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, and a member of the group of eminent persons of the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Frederica, we're really pleased to have you with us today. Your topic the European Union's role as a global player for peace and security is a really appropriate one, a very timely one, given the turbulent and most uncertain period we're living through and where all our assumptions about multilateral institutions, all our assumptions about global peace and security are being shaken on a daily basis. We're very, very eager to hear you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for, you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for being here uh, with me this afternoon. Uh, this university holds uh, a unique place uh, in the world. It is home to great thinkers of the past, uh, from Erasmus onwards, and inspiring leaders of today, uh, such as King Abdullah of Jordan, that I know was studying here, and Malala, that I know is still studying here. <laughs> I'm also humbled to follow in the steps of uh, many great leaders who were invited to deliver the Cyril Foster Lecture. It was mentioned a few moments ago, among them a uh, uh, funding father of the European Union, such as uh, Paul Henri Spack and four Secretary Generals of the United Nations. So I'm honoured and I'm humbled uh, for being here with you today. I was particularly struck by some quotes from my predecessor as High Representative, Javier Solana, who gave this lecture just over 10 years ago. He started his speech at that time with a question, and the question was, why should the European Union play a global role? I will argue that a decade later, this question is in a way outdated, because the European Union is already playing a global role. The title of my speech today is not a question any longer, but an established fact. Yet it is still worth answering that question because we Europeans too often seem to forget the answer to that question and also because the answer has changed compared to a decade ago. The European Union must play a global role because uh, there is no other way to advance our values and our interests. If we want to prevent chaos from spreading, if we want uh, a peaceful resolution of conflicts, a more equal global economy, we need to engage directly as Europeans in world affairs. We can't expect someone else to do the job. We have to take responsibility directly. But there is also another reason, and it has to do with something very popular these days across Europe and across the UK as well, which is uh, taking back control. Today's challenges in the world are definitely too big for any European nation state. From global trade disputes to artificial intelligence, decisions are shaped by those who have or can mobilize a critical mass at the global level. Whether we like it or not, 
a lot of the power today lies with continent-sized powers, but also with companies such as Google or Facebook with billions of users. In such a world, the European Union is our best way as Europeans to regain sovereignty in a globalized world. It is our collective way of taking back control as Europeans. If I look back at these five years, I see a European Union that has worked to protect our common interests and to advance our values on the global scene. And by doing so, we have also become a global point of reference for all those sharing those interests and values. We are living difficult times, global disorder that is clearly in front of us. In this moment of chaos, the European Union has been and is part of a global push to address such disorder through cooperation. I think first and foremost uh, of the work we've done to achieve the nuclear deal with Iran, which prevented a nuclear arms race in a region that was already too tense and is still preventing a conflict in the region. Building on that deal, we at the time managed for a short period of time, too short unfortunately, to bring all regional powers around the same table to discuss how to end the war in Syria. And I believe that such format would be very much needed today. And in the very same months, in 2015, we also worked to reinvigorate the Middle East Quartet to protect the two-state solution for Israel and Palestine. Seems very long ago, it is. It was an expansion phase for multilateralism, well beyond the Middle East. On the global scene, Europe was central for achieving the, P the Paris Agreement against climate change and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It was a moment of hope, but after that expansion phase, a contraction phase followed for multilateralism, for a cooperative approach to foreign policy. Cooperation among global and regional powers was replaced by a new cycle of power competition. We witnessed a new attack against the UN system, possibly the most violent since its foundation. Multilateralism is uh, an essential part of who we are as Europeans. The European Union itself is uh, a multilateral project, is probably the most successful multilateral experiment uh, that history has ever seen. Multilateralism is written in our DNA. It is also a founding value for the European Union, and I believe for the Europeans. At the same time, multilateral agreements, such as the nuclear deal with Iran or the Paris Agreement, have also greatly advanced our interests. And I underline this because too often we fall into the trap of putting one against the other our va values and our interests without understanding that the real way of serving our interests is being true to our values. So as the tide started to turn, the European Union has worked first and foremost to preserve the UN system, the multilateral agreements that we had contributed to achieving. We've become somehow an in indispensable natural partner in this work, and at the same time, a global point of reference and a champion of multilateralism. In the meantime, we have never stopped exploring new multilateral solutions to the great crisis of our times. We've always tried to create the space for multilateral dialogue, for negotiations, for exploring win-win solutions, even when dialogue and cooperation seem to be completely impossible. And sometimes we failed, but sometimes we succeeded. In Venezuela, for instance, in a moment when military confrontation seemed almost inevitable, we created the International Contact Group with partners from Latin America, Europe, the international community. <coughs> to first and foremost stop the escalation and move towards a more positive dynamic, one that could lead towards a peaceful and democratic solution to the crisis. Wherever there was confrontation, we have tried to bring all players to the negotiating table and sometimes actually to create the table where there was none. We haven't been alone in this work. We've always worked together with partners such as uh, the United Nations or the African Union. We have stepped up our practical cooperation with all our partners in Eastern Europe. And in many cases, we have created new alliances with other partners that share our goals. We've helped establish the group of uh, five Sahel countries, the G5 Sahel, 
and their joint military force. We've strengthened our ties with ASEAN, but also with Mercosur or the Pacific Alliance, trying to invest in friendships everywhere in the world to try and build networks that could sustain the multilateral agenda. Winston Churchill believed that the UN system, and I quote, can only survive if it is founded upon broad natural regional groupings. This is also our logic, building a network of regional organizations that work towards our same goal. This is our way to keep the multilateral system alive and make it work better. I am uh, particularly proud of the work we've done with Africa. We've left uh, behind uh, any colonial legacy, and we know that history has been heavy uh, in that uh, respect, and even the old uh, donor-recipient approach. In these years, we have always focused on what Europe and Africa have in common, realizing that our priorities and objectives very often coincide. They were not necessarily at two different sides of the table, but in most cases, we sit around the same table, which is a round one, and share objectives. A strong Africa is one of our core strategic interests. And this is the logic behind our European External Investment Plan for Africa, the largest ever investment plan for the continent. Some uh, uh, ask for a Marshall Plan for Africa. I often say we already have one. It's not American, it's European, it's okay. All this work has required a change of mindset inside Europe. And this is still a work in progress and it's a fight every day. We are progressively realizing that there is no contradiction nor competition between the national interests of European countries and our collective European interest. On the contrary, I believe we are slowly realizing one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. We are realizing that uh, there is uh, uh, no contradiction, I was saying, on the contrary, the only way to effectively serve national interests is through our collective instruments and policies. A couple of examples, again, preserving the nuclear deal with Iran is a collective European interest as well as a national interest of each and every European country. And the same is true for growth in Africa or for Ukraine's resilience. This was one of the key ideas behind the global strategy for foreign and security policy that we prepared in my first two years of mandate. I was certain that we could define a common European vision about our joint role in the world. A vision that was not just the lowest common denominator, but a roadmap, a practical, even a very concrete one, for the years ahead. And thanks to that work, to which some uh, in the academic world have contributed enormously. Thanks to that work, we have achieved progress that seemed totally impossible only three years ago. And I'll uh, make one example that speaks for all on European defense. Building a European defense community was the dream of our founding fathers and let me also say mothers, even if there are few less visible than the fathers, but still there were some. Some 70 years ago, it was a dream that never turned into reality. Today we have finally made this dream come true, although in a very different way compared to what Churchill imagined. Originally the dream of defense integration was all about making war impossible between European countries in an irreversible way. This is still a core part of the European project. This is still a core part of the European Union value that I believe my generation, your generation, can take today for granted exactly because the European Union exists and has been so successful in building peace and cooperation among us. Once you share the same interests, you don't go to war against each other. But today, European integration also serves uh, a different purpose. It is about our role in the world as a global security provider. It is about being a global force for peace. And it is about regaining our sovereignty in an environment that is completely different from that of the 50s. It has nothing to do with the European Union army. On the contrary, I am convinced that we managed to achieve progress on European defense exactly because we put aside the never-ending quarrel about a European Union army. And we focused instead on practical steps that we could take immediately and were immediately needed 
by Europeans and by member states themselves. For instance, we've worked to equip ourselves with the full spectrum of defense capabilities that security in the 21st century requires. We need the most advanced cyber defense technologies. We need our militaries to be capable of intervening in the after aftermath of a natural disaster. We need drones and satellites as much as we need systems to protect our ships from all sorts of threats at sea. No European country can develop this huge range of capabilities alone. No one. But together, as Europeans, we can. How? Using economies of scale. Overcoming fragmentation. And this is exactly what we have started to do in these last three years. Through our new permanent structure cooperation, the European Defence Fund, and all the tools that we have set up in the aftermath of the global strategy. We have worked to make Europe more autonomous, and at the same time, we have strengthened our partnerships like never before. Most of all, our cooperation with NATO. I call it cooperative autonomy. And we've proven wrong all those that were betting on the fact that strengthening autonomy of the European Union would have been at the detriment of partnerships, first of all with NATO, but also with others. We have done exactly the contrary, the two at the same time, in an unprecedented manner. So the European Union's capacity to be a global player, I believe, depends primarily on our resolve to play that role. We clearly have the potential to be a global power. Fulfilling such potential is primarily a matter of political will. It does not need to change our treaties, our structures, but to take decisions to use all the instruments that we already have. Ten years ago, in his speech here in Oxford, Javier Solana had already clear in mind the next steps to develop a stronger European Union foreign policy. Let me quote him again. If the European Union gets its act together on energy, climate change and migration, Solana said, we will have created big building blocks for a foreign policy fit for the 21st century. End of the quote. And indeed, today, I believe we have started to do it in all these fields. On uh, climate change, that's quite clear. We're leading the work on the global scene. On energy, we're starting to realize how much of geopolitical interest and how much of autonomy is there when we work on energy. And on migration. I was uh, sharing with uh, uh, our friends uh, just before coming in here. When I arrived in Brussels uh, uh, five years ago, I was shocked to see that the foreign ministers of the European Union were simply not dealing with migration. Uh, as an Italian foreign minister, you might imagine how much of a, of a distance uh, there was between my national experience and the European one. It was, simply to, it was simply considered to be an issue for interior ministers only, uh, as if migration could be dealt with as a mere border issue. Well, obviously it is not. It is about how and why people get out their country and to our borders. It's about the criminal networks that exploit people's desperation. It's about saving lives at sea and in the desert, where you see people that are losing their lives and where you don't see them. It's about investments and job opportunities. It's about human rights. It's about good governance. We started investing together. We started looking together as Europeans into the dynamics of the phenomenon. And we started to act together with our partners on this, to create jobs, to address security issues, for instance, in a crucial area such as the Sahel, the major transit routes from the African uh, countries of origin to Europe. We set up an unprecedented form of trilateral cooperation, extremely effective between the European Union, the African Union, and the UN agencies that are dealing with migrants and refugees, the IOM and the UNHCR, helping over 50,000 people who were detained in the detention centers in Libya get out of the centers, being saved, and being, thanks to the work the European Union, the African Union, and the UN have jointly done, to go back home safely, voluntarily, in a protected manner, and start a new life. This work was part of uh, the change in mindset that I have described. Moving away from crisis management mode only, 
that is a strong temptation if you are surrounded by so many crises around you. But moving away from that mode only and looking beyond the crisis of the moment and working to prevent the next crisis or to stabilize countries that are coming out of a conflict and that risk to fall back again into a crisis mode if you don't invest to stabilize them properly. We put the concept of resilience at the center of our work. I could mention the work we've done in Iraq or in Colombia, but the best example of this investment on resilience, I believe, is our engagement with Ukraine. The conflict in Donbas uh, and the illegal annexation of Crimea are still ongoing, but compared to five years ago, Ukraine is a completely different country. It is a much stronger country, thanks primarily to the Ukrainian people, their stubbornness in demanding and working for change, anti-corruption, reforms, but also thanks to the European Union's contribution. In five years, we've put together the largest support package in the history of the European Union. No one has invested in Ukraine as much as we did, and, no one, uh, and we have never invested anywhere else as much as we have invested in Ukraine. No individual European country could have done the same alone. No one. Such work truly makes a positive difference in the life of millions, inside and outside the European Union. Sometimes I imagine in my mind what would happen in the world if the European Union external action was to disappear for 24 hours. What would happen in Africa, what would happen in Asia, what would happen in Latin America, in the Arctic, along the uh, maritime routes to the UN? No individual country can do this alone. And I think they all realize the potential of the United European Foreign Policy with member states and European institutions acting in unison. Yet, the work we have started in these years, first of all, has been difficult, continues to be difficult, and needs to be consolidated and completed. Some bold decisions will have to be taken by European leaders. Some consistency will be needed. Already in the coming days and weeks, let me mention the first such decision that uh, I imagine will be coming in the next couple of days will be about the Balkans and their future within the European Union. Europe, I believe, will be a strong global force only if we complete the work to stabilize our own continent and to make war impossible in a reversible manner inside Europe, all of Europe. Because every time I say Europe has been in peace for 60, 70 years, I'm reminded, and rightly so, of the wars in the Balkans. That was only 20 years ago. To do so, to make war impossible inside our continent, we need to unify Europe, bring in the Balkans within the European Union. In these years, we have achieved uh, in the Balkans some crucial steps. The PRESPA agreement between Greece and North Macedonia, important progress even with difficult setbacks in the talks between Belgrade and Pristina, some crucial reforms all across the region in each of the six partners we have in the Balkans. And most importantly, a completely new awareness in the region among the leaders and the people of the region that cooperation among them is more convenient than confrontation. The very same basic principle that originated the first steps towards the European Union after World War II. We stopped fighting each other in the moment when we realized that making business together was much more convenient than fighting each other. To consolidate this progress in the Balkans, I believe it is now time to open accession negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania, and I hope our leaders will take the right decision in the coming days. At the same time, we must push forward the work on Europe's strategic autonomy. And this is not just about security and defense. We've discussed that also. It is not just about security and defense. It's about the freedom of European countries to choose their trade partners autonomously based on our interests and values and not on decisions taken in other capitals. Strategic autonomy is about the role of the euro in the international financial system. And it is about our capacity to set rules on a global level. For instance, the rules on data protection or on artificial intelligence. Strategic autonomy is about contributing to shaping a more cooperative global order, more democratic, more equal, more peaceful. Europe is not alone in this endeavor. 
we may feel more and more lonely. Sometimes it's also a personal feeling. You see the world around you is not really going in the direction you wish it was going. But there is a whole world that shares our goals and our aspirations. From Canada to Southeast Asia, from Chile to New Zealand, many all around the world share our same approach to world politics. And there is a new generation of leaders who have the courage of seeking peace after decades of war. And I think, for instance, at the winner of this year's Nobel Peace Prize, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, a brave man, a brave young man that I've met several times and that has invested enormously, not only in changing his own country, but also in trying to change the dynamics in a difficult region in Africa and inspiring the continent as a whole. But even more importantly, there is hope coming from so many of our societies, citizens who are taking responsibility for the countries and for our planet. Uh, there was a great U.S. president not long ago that said that uh, the most important office in a democracy is not the president or the prime minister. The most important office is the citizen, and I believe he's right. Europe's role in the world is also to be on the side of those individuals, of those movements. As a friend, as a partner, someone you can rely upon, for all peace builders and change makers. And I've seen this responsibility, this quest for responsibility exercised on the European Union level in the eyes of all my interlocutors around the world. I hope the same awareness of how important our role as Europeans is can be developed inside every single European citizen so that we can respond properly to that request for partnership in the world. Thank you.